Hello everybody and welcome to a new video on my channel. The title of this video is The Battle of Cable Street, a clash between anti-fascists and fascists. If you are new to the channel, hello there and be sure to stay and check my other videos. I usually upload on Sundays and I talk about black British history, that is any history about black and other non-whites in the UK and the British Empire. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and keep notified. Link to my PayPal is in the description. On October 4th, 1936, Sir Oswald Mosley, the leader of the British Union of Fascists, or the BUF, led a demonstration on the fourth anniversary of the party's foundation. They decided to organise a provocative march in Stepney, East London, where a large Jewish community used to live. Plans for that date, the Jewish People's Council in response presented a petition in which 100,000 people signed to urge the Home Secretary to ban the march and for 7,000 police to accompany it. However, the government refused to ban the march. The BUF had the support of the police and press, especially the Daily Mail, who ran headlines in the 1930s, such as Hurrah for Black Shirts, a black shirt being a member of a fascist party. Reporting on October 12, 1936, Time magazine summarised the event in an article called Mosley Shall Not Pass. It wrote, Ignoring orders from the Labour Party and prominent British Labour leaders, half a million British proletarians, liberally sprinkled with Jews, went on an anti-fascist rampage last week, which turned out to be London's biggest riot in years. Every provocation had been given the proletariat by number one British fascist, Sir Oswald Mosley, who had announced weeks ahead that his 5,000 of his black shirts would march through the torturous streets of London's Jewish quarter east of the Tower. This was interpreted by Jews and workers alike as a challenge to battle, the British Communist Party hurling its cohorts with the slogan, Mosley shall not pass. In this video, I explore the history of the British Union of Fascists, briefly on Oswald Mosley and the East End of London, particularly where Cable Street sits in. The British Union of Fascists were a merger of two political parties, the New Party and the British Fascists, the latter being the first British organisation to claim the label fascist. The New Party was formed by Oswald Mosley after a split from the Labour Party on March 1st, 1931. Back on December 6th, 1930, he, his wife and 16 other Labour MPs signed the Mosley Memorandum, expressing their dissatisfaction with the laissez-faire attitudes of both the Labour and Conservative parties. While the new party was not initially fascist, it became a fascist party when Mosley desired complete control of the party's policies, leading multiple members to resign. On October 27th, 1931, he contested as a candidate to be elected as an MP for the new party in the Stroke-on-Trent constituency, but was unsuccessful. After that, he toured Europe, visiting Italy and was impressed by Mussolini's policies, adopting fascism in the new party. The youth section adopted grey shirt uniforms. On October 1st, 1932, the new party and the British fascists merged to form the British Union of Fascists, as well as launching the party's programme called the Greater Britain. The party enjoyed a vast growth of membership, peaking at 50,000 members at one point, as well as being very militant. They held multiple meetings, marches and public rallies. One of their largest rallies was held in Olympia Stadium, Stadium in London on June 7, 1934. 10,000 people attended the meeting, where 2,000 of Mosley's black shirts were present. 500 anti-fascists, primarily members of the Communist Party of Great Britain, secured tickets. The counter-protest led by the anti-fascists disrupted the meeting. In response, bodyguards from the BUF violently attacked the demonstrators. The Times newspaper reported, Stewards at once made for the offenders. If they resisted ejection, the incident at once became an affair of fisticuffs, and if the victim remained standing at the end of his resistance, he was seized jiu-jitsu fashion and dragged out. Quite a number were borne out limp bodies after the phrase. A number of arrests were made against the anti-fascists outside the venue, when, where they were met with further violence by the police. 
The Daily Worker, the paper of the Communist Party, reported that outside Olympia, seething crowds of thousands of workers kept up a continual anti-fascist uproar, despite the enormous special concentration of police forces which had been gathered for the black shirt's protection. The newspaper pointed to the fact that 24 anti-fascists were arrested compared to one BUF supporter, spoke volumes about the different treatment by the police towards the BUF and CPGB. Quoted in the Times, Mosley claimed, For over three weeks, certain communist and socialist papers have published incitements to their readers to attack this meeting. The result was that a large red mob gathered outside the hall for the purpose of intimidating those who entered, and very many of the audience were in fact jostled before they managed to enter the meeting at all. The BUF blamed the violence on the communists, although they still claimed the fascist response as a victory, while the communists claimed their activism as a victory. Conservative MP Geoffrey Lloyd was also quoted in the Times as he said, I am not very sympathetic to communists who try to break up meetings, but I am bound to say that I was appalled by the brutal conduct of the fascists last night. The violence injected, ejected by the fascists backfired quickly as they lost the support of Lord Rothermere, who ran the Daily Mail. And it was claimed that the BUF's membership fell from 40,000 to 5,000 by the summer of 1935. During their existence, the BUF seeked alliances with Mussolini and Hitler, adopting anti-Semitism through their ranks. Mosley promoted the idea that Jews were behind Britain's social um, cultural decline of the 1930s, sustaining a conspiracy that Jews were responsible for the spread of decadence within art, literature, cinema and uh, sport. Um, one can interpret that the Jewish people, according to the fascists, was responsible for the Great Depression. The BUF also received a subsidy from Mussolini's government, equivalent to £2 million a year. Mosley was also praised by Hitler for a number of anti-Jewish speeches in public. Even in May 11th, 1935, Mosley sent Hitler a telegram saying, please receive my greatest thanks for your kind telegram in relation to my speech in Leicester, which was received while I was away from London. I esteem greatly your advice in the midst of our hard struggle. The forces of Jewish corruption must be overcome in all great countries before the future of Europe can be made secure in justice and peace. Our struggle to this end is hard, but our victory is certain. According to the website History Extra, the number of black shirts that rallied with Mosley was actually 3,000, despite Time magazine reporting 5,000. Over three quarters of the mob were under 18 and 400 being women due to the BUF's gender equality policies. Actually, the BUF seemed more progressive than the Labour and Conservative parties when it came to women's rights, after masses of women were being made redundant, including suffragettes, in which many defected to the BUF. This prompted the BUF to encourage a more supportive approach to the women question. A prominent suffragette, Mary Richardson, became the head of the women's section of the BUF. The BUF said that women would not be required to stay at home, would offer equal wages to women and would remove the marriage bar that restricted employment to married women. Anyway, back to the Cable Street. Da the Daily Worker called for people to block Mosley's march. The Communist Party were actually going to demonstrate in Trafalgar Square, but cancelled as they redirected its supporters to the East End. The Jewish Chronicle warned its readers to stay at home that day. Also that day, thousands of anti-fascists began their gathering at Gardiner's Corner in Oldgate, located, also located in the East End. Mosley gathered his black shirts at the Royal Mint in the Tower of London as 6,000 police cleared the path for them at Whitechapel, which is where they were originally going to go. Whitechapel was also a Jewish area. Back in Oldgate, additional police officers tried to force anti-fascist crowds to stay on the pavement, but they were not successful. In addition, four sympathetic tram drivers um, abandoned their vehicles to help block the roads set for fascists. 
communists, Jews, Irish dockers and trade unionists came together chanting down with the fascists and mostly shall not pass. Because the police could not mobilise the crowds, the BUF changed their route and headed down to Cable Street, which was more narrow. Despite the change, anti-fascists were well ahead as they began building in the street to block the fascists. The Communist Party also established a medical station. The community placed glass and marbles and pavement slabs were pulled up. This all happened earlier that morning. As the police entered Cable Street, they tried to remove the barricades. When this happened, equipment such as rotten fruit, kitchen appliances, bottles and boiling water were thrown from windows. A lot of fights broke out. This forced the police to withdraw and informed Oswald Mosley that he could not march with his supporters through the East End. As a result, he ordered his troops to divert to the opposite direction. Soon they dispersed. A victory parade was held by the anti-fascists, despite 79 of them being arrested compared to five fascists. Most anti-fascists were fined, but a few were sentenced to hard labour for three months. A mural was commissioned in Cable Street in 1976. It sits on the wall where it says, The Battle of Cable Street. The people of East London rallied to Cable Street on 4th October 1936 and forced back to the march of the fascist Oswald Mosley and his black shirts through the streets of the East End. And in quotations at the bottom, it says, They shall not pass. The mural still exists today. Before, before I finish this video, I want to thank everyone for the 200 subscribers, which I reached on January 20th. I did not expect this rapid rise. And when I looked on my YouTube studio at, uh, app, sorry, most of the views seemed to have recommended my last two videos from other videos that they had been watching. This means my videos are being somewhat favored by the algorithm. And I hope this continues. Thank you for watching my video and I hope you enjoyed it.